Hi everyone. Today what we're going to do is we're going to go through a full factoring review from previous years and to add in maybe a little bit of new stuff. What you'll see on the screen right now are four complex trinomials and what I'd like you to do is to go ahead and factor those on your own. So let's go ahead, factor those, pause the video now and we'll meet up on the other side. Okay, we should be back. So as we examine that first trinomial, we notice that we've got a leading coefficient of 3. So we're looking at two numbers that multiply to give 3. We look at the constant at the end. I have a 4. I have two numbers that multiply to give 4. I am not going to choose 2 and 2. Now, this is where we get a little bit better than what we were previously. I can tell that I can't have factors of 2 and 2 from that 4 because when I go through to multiply across to get my middle term, I notice that I'm multiplying two numbers by 2. That gives me a 2 and a 6. And any time I multiply something by 2, I create even numbers. And there is no way that I can put together even numbers in any way and create an odd. And so, when I start to look through and say, two numbers that multiply to give 4, I know that those values have to be 4 and 1. Now, if we can start to drive that instinct, then I think we're doing great. However, worst case is... We look at it and we say, okay, two numbers that multiply to give four, two and two. We then go six and two. I can't get a seven out of that. We're not going to bother trying to flip it because it's the same number. So we scratch it out and then we come in on four and one. When I multiply those across, I'm going to end up getting a four and a three and I can make a seven out of that if they're both negative. There's my negative 7. I get a little confirmation that I have a positive 4. Put in your brackets and your variable, and we are factored. You take a look at B. B now, complex trinomial, two numbers that multiply to give 2, two numbers that multiply to give 5. I may argue to you that there is a better way to tackle this now that we may have done this. Hey, two numbers are multiplied to give 10, 2 and 5. But I want to draw to your attention that I know right from the very beginning that those cannot be my factors. If I was to put my brackets around there, then I see that I would have had a bracket that would have been 2x plus or minus 2. And in that case... I would have had a common factor inside that bracket. I look back up at my original, and I notice that there is no common factor. And so therefore, when I factor it, I still can't have a common factor. And so, I get a little bit better then at knowing that if I chose 2 and 1 from factors of 2, which would be the only way that it could factor then I know that I can't have my 2 up on top, that if it does factor, it's got to be 5 and 2 or 10 and 1. I do a quick check. There's a 4, there's a 5. Yes, I can get 9 out of that if I put in my variable and my brackets, and I'm good. So what I'd like you to do is go ahead and give the next two a shot. So pause the video now, and we'll see if we're a little bit better. Okay, and we should be back. And so we take a look at C. I now have my 6x squared, so I'm dealing with factors. I'm probably going to try 3 and 2 first. I got 14, so I'm probably trying like 7 and 2 first. I've got to get up to 17. So if I do my 7 down here, I can get a 21 and a 4. That's going to get me to 17. I need a positive 17, so my larger number has to be bigger. There's my positive 21, negative 4. I should be good. Brackets and variable. 
take a look at D, and we can play around with the same thing. The one thing I do know for certain is when I look at that constant at the end, since it is a prime number, I know my only options are 5 and 1. So it then becomes all my options for 12. Maybe I go to the middle first, and I go 4 and 3. There's a 15 and a 4. I can't get a 4 out of that. So if I flip that, that's a 20 and a 3. That means I'm getting even farther away. So what I know then is it was not 4 and 3. And so if I try a 6 and a 2, then I can play with my 5 and my 1. There's a 6 and a 10. I can get a negative 4 if my 10 is negative and my 6 is positive. Put in your brackets and your variable, and we are factored. So that should give you a pretty decent review of what you're going to end up having to factor most often, that being simple and complex trinomials. Now, let's see where we go with this stuff. So what you'll see on the screen right now is a number of expressions that I'm going to ask you guys to be able to factor. So one of the first things is I'm never going to ask you guys to factor an expression that is not factorable. So you know if I ask you to factor, if you're given that instruction, then there has to be the means to factor it. So let's make sure that we don't write as a conclusion, well, it is not factorable. It will be. So what I would like you to do is to pause the video on this screen, and I want you to give all 10 of those problems a shot. Like seriously, play around with them for a while. See how they go. They're big puzzles. But these are going to incorporate all the different types of expressions that we're going to need to factor moving forward. Then when you think you've given them a pretty decent shot, then unpause the video, and we'll go through and put up uh, factorable expressions for each one of them. I think it's very valuable for you right now to pause them and see how they go. Quite often, factoring questions are very easy to see when you see a solution to it. You know, they make logical sense and you can follow it through. But there's a difference between a solution making sense to you and could you have produced that solution on your own. So I think it's really important, even if we struggle, pause the video, give them a shot, and we'll see how it works out. Okay, pause the video now. Okay, and so we're back. So hopefully you've given everything a shot. I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit, and I'm going to go through since we have some solutions. Feel free to pause the video, rewind it, watch it as you need to. Okay, but I'm going to go through with some confidence talking about maybe some key look fors. So first thing that we should look for when we take a look at E, the first question I always ask myself is how many terms? And I notice in that expression that I have two terms. Terms are always separated by addition and subtraction, so I've got two terms. And then when I go down my checklist, I'll say, well, the first thing I look for at those two terms, is there a common factor? There is no common factor. So the next thing that I consider is, is it a difference of squares? Well, first off, it checks off the difference category because now I have a subtraction in between. And then when I take a look at that first term, it is a perfect square. The second term is a perfect square. I have my difference of squares. And so if I go through then, what was squared in the first term was MP. What was squared in the last term was 10A. I know that to get a difference of squares, I need conjugates. So one of the brackets has a plus and one of the brackets has a minus. That's how my middle term disappeared when I expanded. Okay, let's take a look at F. First question I always ask myself, how many terms do I have? And although F is a big, ugly expression, it's really only three terms. So the next question I ask, is there anything in common in those three terms? And I am hoping that that bracket jumps out at you. I wanted to walk through a problem like F because there is a common problem solving tool that we can use, and that's substitution. Not substitution of how do we solve a system of equations, but rather anytime I see 
a complex expression. And I understand that x plus 1 is not complex, but it is two terms. That I can see that repeated two-term expression pop up over and over again, then maybe I use substitution, and I substitute in something simpler, like just a. If I do that, then my first term becomes this. My second term becomes this. And my third term becomes this. Now, I know that that looks a little weird to us because our variables are not in alphabetical order. But when I ask you, do you see a common factor in all three of those red terms, my guess is that A screams at you. Maybe we don't see it up in the original expression as easily, but we should see it in that red expression. And so what you would do then is factor out your A and then... What are you left with? And then you would finish on factoring. So when we get into this instance, I don't want to do the red if I don't have to. However, it is a great tool if you're unsure. Instead, if I take a look at that first expression and I say, do I see anything in common in every term? And I notice that I see an x plus 1 in every term, then I can factor that out from the first term, factor it out from the second term, factor it out from the third term, and I have factored that expression. You'll notice what I started with, x plus 1 equaling a being my substitution, there is my a equaling x plus 1 in my expression. The other reason why I want to talk about f is because we have a tendency to factor and then move on. Always stop yourself and ask, can that be factored further? You look at that second factor in that expression and you notice that we have a complex trinomial. Maybe it can factor further. And if I take a look, I can see that that will factor further. And therefore... In factoring that last trinomial, I can actually get down to a fully factored expression. There we go. F is now factored because it is fully factored. Okay, let's keep it going with each problem. Okay, now you take a look at G. And what you'll notice in G is we get to the first time where we have a four-term expression. So we go through that exact same checklist. Okay, first thing I always look for is a common factor. And do I see a common factor in all four terms? No. Well, the next thing I do then if I see four terms is I try to factor it by grouping. And maybe I try factoring two and two. Well, I look at those first two terms and I notice that I have a difference of squares. And so I can factor that into an a plus b and an a minus b. I look at the last two terms, and I notice that I have a common factor of c in there. So I can factor out that c. And a lot of people are going to stop there. One of the reasons I wanted to talk about something like g is because if I was to put that on an evaluation, I would expect to see a lot of answers like that. And now we need to try to decipher, do we think that's factored, or did we just hit a roadblock and we didn't know where to go? I take a look at that, and I always look, is it fully factored? And you'll notice that that blue line isn't even factored at all. Because to factor something means we have to break it up through multiply, and you'll notice that I don't have multiply on that line. Now, what do I mean by that? Simply answer the question, how many terms? That plus sign in the middle should be screaming at you because that creates one term and two terms. And if I have multiple terms, then it is not factored. Maybe I just haven't factored fully. So now I look within those two terms and I say, do I have a common factor? Uh, nope. Is it a difference of squares? 
Hmm, nope. And therefore, that's not factored. Now, our conclusion may be, oh, wait a sec, maybe this one isn't factorable. And remember what I said at the beginning. Maybe I just didn't group it well. So let's take a peek then at that expression. And let's go through and see if there was a better way to group it. So I'm going to get rid of that blue. And I need to now try to think of how else could I group it rather than 2 and 2. And I'm going to consider 3 and 1. So when we examine G, you start to look at it and say, well, how can I put three terms together that seems to make a pattern, seems to make sense? Well, your initial thought may be those three terms are all perfect squares. This term at the end is one that seems a little weird. Maybe I group it that way. I want you to take a look at those first three terms and think, is there a way that you could factor that? And maybe we quickly arrive at a case where we're like, oh, no, I don't think so. So let me get rid of that grouping idea. I like to call question G one of the questions where it's like one of these things is not like the other. And for any of you guys who've had me before, I call that one your Sesame Street question. If you can answer that question, which one of these things is not like the other, it tends to lead you in the right path. Regardless of how you answer that question, I think most people are going to be directed in the same way. So perhaps I say, I think that the C squared, the A squared, and the 2AC all go together. Because I can see A's, C's, and a mixture of those in all three terms. Well, then you're going to be directed to try to view that expression this way. But maybe I have a bunch of people that go, yeah, but wait a sec, I see the 2AC term as being the one that's not like the other because it doesn't have any squares, because it has a multiple variable term. Well, then maybe you think, I'm going to put that in with the rest, which means i got to get rid of the B squared. If we arrive at that red expression, then we can see that those first three terms actually represents a trinomial. And that trinomial is factorable. And so if I factor the first three terms, then they happen to be a perfect square. Anytime it's a perfect square, I want to write it as a perfect square. And now when I look to see am I fully factored, how many terms do I have now? I have two terms. Is there a common factor? No. But is it a difference of squares? Yes. And so if I go to factor that, then I have to have what was squared in the first uh, term of each factor, what was squared in the last term of each factor, and then a plus and a minus in between. I would throw question G in there as a bit of a doozy. I think that one can be tough. Let's take a look at H now. H I would probably throw into as one of your weirder problems because it really challenges you on your factoring checklist. As you take a peek at question H, we go through that checklist. How many terms do you have? You have three terms. Is there a common factor in all three of those terms? The answer is no. So then what do you look at? Well, it doesn't look like a complex trinomial. It doesn't look like a simple trinomial because it doesn't fit a pattern. Well, if we have three terms and there isn't a common factor and it doesn't fall into a squared something, a single something, and a constant, then we actually have to try factoring by grouping. I want you to take a look at the last two terms. And let's try to factor the last two terms. So do you see something in common in the last two terms? Yeah, we have a y in there. So let's not touch the first term. 
But now, let's factor out a y. If I blindly factor out a y from the last two terms, I get to that expression. And I'm hoping that we kind of feel motivated to do something. That is, to fully factor that expression, I need to be able to go past this point. Which means, when I factor those last two terms, I want to find the same thing, if possible, as what I have in the first term. And so my act to factor out a positive y doesn't give me that same thing. However, if I instead factor out a negative y, then you'll notice that would leave me with a positive 5x and now a positive 2. And you can see under my gold arrows, I do have the same thing. So in that blue expression, how many fact or terms do you have? You have two. Do you notice anything in common between them? Yes, we have a common factor of 5x plus 2. So let's factor that out of the first term, which means we have another factor of 5x plus 2, and out of the last term, a y. Okay, I would throw those into your quirkier category of factoring. Let's see where we go next. As you take a look at question I, you'll notice you have four terms. Within those four terms, do you have any common factors? Nope. So now we look to factor by grouping. Maybe we don't see any patterns, so you just blindly kind of go factor two and two. And now I look to see if I can factor. Well, I can factor from the first two terms because there is a common factor of x squared. And as I factor that out of the first two terms, I'm left with an x and a plus one. Now, you can just write that out, and most people will. But maybe they struggle to now see this next expression. How many terms do you have? You still have three terms, so it's not factored. However, I know this might look a little weird. Just remember that you can always factor out a positive 1 from anything. And sometimes, by factoring out of 1 from the last two terms, you actually make a common factor jump out at you. Look at that blue line now and notice how many terms do you have? You have 2. And is there a common factor in both those terms? There is a common factor of x plus 1. What are you left with from the first term? An x squared. What are you left with from the last term? A 1. And there we go. Now, one of the reasons I wanted you guys to look at question I was to get comfortable factoring cubics. We're going to factor a ton of cubics this year. And those cubics are going to take the, uh, the form of a four-term expression. Take a look at J. Because it's not so much as guess and check as what it may look you guys are actually going to get pretty quick at being able to factor j. I'm going to go through j very quickly. I have a four-term expression. And as I scan down all four terms, I notice that I have a common factor of x. So I factor out that x. And when I factor out the x, I'm left with 6x to the fourth minus 2x cubed minus 9x plus 3. But now when I take a look inside that red factor at the end, I notice that I still have four terms. I don't have a common factor. And now I try to group two and two. When I factor that two and two, I can actually take a quick peek and see that that is factorable right at the very beginning. The way I can do that is I'm going to look at the relationship between consecutive coefficients and the constant. If you look at those values that I've just circled in gold and then drawn arrows to, my consecutive values can be looked at as a ratio. So if I take my 2 and I divide it by my 6, if I get the same value as my 3 divided by 9, Notice, both of those fractions equal one-third. 
Now, I should be considering the sine of those values as well. So like it's really a negative two divided by a positive six and a positive three divided by a negative nine. So yes, it's a negative one third. But most of the time, if I just look at the values, that'll be enough to trigger me to get going. So I can tell that because when I divided my coefficients and my constant, I got the same value, I feel pretty confident that that four-term expression will factor further. So I still have the x from the first term. I'm going to put a big square bracket in so I don't get confused. And now I'm going to factor that 2 and 2. Pull out my greatest common factor of a 2x cubed from both the first two terms. That's going to leave me with a 3x minus 1. And my greatest common factor in the last two terms is going to be 3. But just as we talked about earlier, I want to factor out whatever is going to give me the exact same term inside those brackets. And notice that by factoring out my negative 3, that gives me factors of 3x minus 1. Well, it's still not factored because inside the big square brackets, I still have two terms. So now, what was the common factor in both of those terms? 3x minus 1. That leaves me with a 2x cubed from the first term and a negative 3 from the last term. And there we go. I'm fully factored. Good to go. What you saw in J is going to be something that we're going to look at over and over and over again. So, I want everybody to use K now as another check. So I might be offering up, hey, let's pause the video now and give K another shot if we weren't able to factor it earlier. Okay, we should be back. So I take a quick peek. And I have 4 divided by 6, that's 2 thirds. I have 6 divided by 9, that's 2 thirds. I'm pretty sure that this is going to factor by grouping. So if I pull out a 2a squared from the first two terms, then that leaves me with a 3a plus 2. If I pull out the common factor of 3 from the last two terms, then that leaves me with a 3a plus 2. And I actually just got confirmation that it does factor. Pull out the common factor of 3a plus 2. That leaves me with 2a squared from the first term, positive 3 from the last term. And now it's fully factored. Okay, let's jump into L. Because L might have caused some people some problems, and I want to address maybe one potential, I don't want to call it a mistake, but an error in judgment when you're asked to factor. One of the key indicators for you is anytime you're asked a factor, fight the urge to want to expand. That's going in the opposite direction. So when you take a look at L, you notice that you have two terms. Is there anything in common in those two terms? No. Then our checklist should have brought us to difference of squares. And you'll notice that you do have a difference of squares in L. Now, maybe we can't see automatically how to factor that. I'm going to use a little substitution. I'm going to let a equal x minus 1. Because that then is going to allow that expression to look more simplified as a to the 4th minus 1. If that looks that way, now maybe we can see that that's really just an a squared minus 1 times an a squared plus 1. I want to avoid that if I can, and maybe I could see it as a difference of squares right at the very beginning, which meant that I was then able to factor that as, okay, what was squared in the first term? x minus 1 squared. What was squared in the last term? And now there's a minus and a plus in between. Notice that my red expression is the same as my final blue expression. I just have the x minus 1 in for my a. Okay, I hope we didn't stop there, though, because you'll also notice that that's not fully factored. Look back at your blue expression and notice that the factor that I've circled in green 
is still a difference of squares. So that actually factors further. That if you were to factor that further, we would then have an a plus 1 times an a minus 1, then times that a squared minus uh, plus 1. The first term will factor further. Sorry, the first factor will factor further. However, that last factor does not factor. There's no such thing as a sum of squares. So if that's that instance then, then I can factor my red expression a little further. This first factor will factor further. So what was squared in the first term? It's an x minus 1. What was squared in the last term? With a plus, with a minus. And then I still have that last term that couldn't be factored. We get to that point and we are almost finished. The only thing that we have to do is simplify our factors. I know this might seem like a weird case, but I'm going to actually ask you to collect like terms or expand any brackets to be able to simplify your factors. It'll seem like a weird example, but it's as if I asked you, tell me two numbers that multiply to give 15. And you told me, um, 4 plus 1 and uh, 2 plus 1. You would never tell somebody that as an answer. You're going to tell them 5 times 3. And so what we have in that last red line is kind of like you telling somebody 4 plus 1 and 2 plus 1. You've given them unsimplified factors. So let's spend one line cleaning all that up. You'll notice that in the first factor, my x minus 1 plus 1, the 1s will cancel out, so it just becomes an x. My next factor will simplify to x minus 2. And my last factor, i got to do a little bit of work. Expand the brackets on your x minus 1 all squared, and then collect another 1 in there. So if you expand your brackets, you're going to get an x squared. You're going to get a minus 2x plus 1, then plus 1. And so our final factor will be our plus 2. And there we go. We're starting to get a little quirkier in L. And now we're going to move into the doozies on the last ones. So I want you to take a look at question M. Because I'm going to challenge to you that I think M would be one of the uglier ones that we'll play with. Not because it's more difficult. It's just going to look quite long. Let's take a look at M and let's break it down on our checklist. How many terms do you have? Hopefully we can see that we have two terms. Is there a common factor in those terms? No. So the next thing I look for is, is it a difference of squares? And I should be able to recognize that yes, it is. First off, in the first term, 25 is a perfect square. x minus 3y squared has to be a perfect square because of the squared. Same thing in the last term. 16 is a perfect square. And the last factor is a perfect square because there's a perfect square. So if I just get rid of all those arrows, you'll notice that I actually have a difference of squares. So how can I factor that then? Well, I know that I'm going to get two big factors. And I think the easiest way to tackle something like this is to just say, what was factored to give you the first term? What was factored, or sorry, squared to give you the last term? And I know that a difference of squares factors into conjugates, so one has a plus, one has a minus. That is actually factored. But just like what we talked about in the previous problem, I have to make sure that those factors are simplified. And when you take a look inside that first really big factor, you'll notice that you've got some x terms, you've got some y terms, you're going to be able to collect like terms. So let's collect. This line I'm going to put in in green, 
I never have to see. You can collect terms as fast as you want to, so don't feel like you have to. Expand the brackets. If you don't want to. Go straight to. Well, I'm going to have 5 times x, and I'm going to have 4 times 3x, so that's a 5x and a 12x, so therefore, that's 17x. And then I'm going to have a negative 15y, and I'm going to have a negative 4y, and so that's a negative 19y. If you're comfortable, don't show me the green, just deal with the blue. So let's take a look at the next factor and see if we can make it work. We can tell that we're going to get a 5x and a negative 12x, so that's going to be a negative 7x. And then we're going to have a negative 15y and a positive 4y. So my negative 15 and my positive 4 gives me a negative 11y. Now, we take a look at that last factor, and you'll notice that we just have a little bit of a form issue. General form is going to state that if all terms within a factor are negative, then let's pull out that negative factor. And so, I'm going to factor out a negative 1 from that last factor. So, if I factor out that negative 1, then I get to that. It still doesn't change what the first factor was. And now I have that expression fully factored and in good form. Okay, let's take a peek at the last one. What you see on your screen is our last expression. And I think this one might play into kind of the quirky category. Let's go down our checklist. We'll see how things go. Okay, first thing I look for, how many terms do I have in the expression? And I have three terms. First thing I look for, common factor. And I notice that within the first term, second term, third term, there is a common factor of D. So I pull that out from the first term. I pull that out from the second term. And I pull that out from the third term. Well, now I get to that point, and I've got inside that bracket four terms, or three terms, but could be simplified. And so I'm going to clean up that last factor. I have a 1 minus an r minus another r, so negative 2r, and plus my r squared. Okay, well, can I factor that further? And I notice that that trinomial inside the brackets is a perfect square. And so I can factor that into a 1 minus r times 1 minus r. I just know that that's bad form. Since it is a perfect square, I'm going to write it as a perfect square. We get down to that point. I think we're doing great. However... I would like to show you a different way. That maybe when we take a look back up at that original expression, and I'm simply going to copy out the expression so we don't get lost in all that blue writing that I've already put down, that perhaps we start this problem and we don't see the common factor of D. And instead we view it as 1, 2, three terms, and we try to factor by grouping. Look at the last two terms, and you'll notice that those last two terms have common factors. So maybe when I play around with this, I leave the first term, and I instead factor it from the last term. I notice that there is a D and an R in both of those terms. And so I'm going to factor out a negative dr. That leaves me with a 1 and a minus r for my last two terms. 
Okay, well now when I take a peek at that, I have a two-term expression. Is there anything in common in those two terms? Yep. I have a 1 minus r. Well, if we factor out that 1 minus r, then what we're left with from the first term is a d, and what we're left with from the last term is a negative dr. And we may be tempted to stop. However, look inside those last two terms, that last factor, and you'll notice that both of those terms contain the d. So we could go ahead and we could factor out that d now from the last factor. And you'll notice that we come in then on something like that. A lot of this ending could have been taken care of, though, if instead we had even recognized after the first line that when we went, then went to factor, we could have actually pulled out a common factor of d from both terms and the 1 minus r from both terms. That would have left us with a 1 from the first term, and a negative r from the last term, which brings us again to d times 1 minus r squared. So a number of different ways to work through the last one, but my guess is if you look back on all of these, that last one was probably one of the quirkier ones. So there's solutions for all of that stuff. Your job today, get some practice with factoring. If you are able to work your way through problems one through three automatically, then I think you've got great stuff with you in your factoring. If you're able to work through problem four pretty decently, then I think you're exactly where you need to be. You've got everything covered. You're good. Problem five is going to have the quirkier ones in it. And so if we're able to struggle our way through them at times, or if we have a few problems with them, that's no big deal. I would not be concerned. Your job, get really, really good at being able to factor one through three and pretty decent at four, and I think you're fine. Okay, best of luck with your practice.